up. Present and accounted for. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Main public, we are one minute away. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of Maine's Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And I'm delighted to be joined this afternoon by Secretary of State Matt Dunlap, who's here to join us today to discuss safety protocols and other topics related to this year's general election. I'll kick things off this afternoon with an update on COVID-19 and then turn things over to Secretary Dunlap. Right now across the state, there are a total of 5,639 total cases of COVID-19, an increase of 35 cases since yesterday. Of those, 5,048 are confirmed, an increase of 37, and 591 are probable cases, a decrease of two cases since yesterday. Overall, 459 individuals have been hospitalized cumulatively since the beginning of the pandemic. And in the past 30 days, 28 individuals have been hospitalized. Right now in the, in the state, seven individuals are currently hospitalized, one of whom is in the ICU and none of whom is on a ventilator. That makes our current hospitalization rate approximately 0.5 hospitalizations for every 100,000 people. To put that number in the national context, the United States countrywide rate is approximately nine hospitalizations for every 100,000. The rate in Maine right now is approximately 0.5 per 100,000. 142 individuals have passed away, the same number as it has been since yesterday, and 4,900 have recovered, an increase of 20 recoveries since yesterday. Among our cases are 1,077 healthcare workers, an increase of one. To put some of these recent numbers in context, 27% of the new cases in the past 24 hours have been amongst individuals who live in Cumberland County. 25% of the new cases have been from York County and 16% of the cases from Kennebec County. I'd like to turn next to provide some updates on some outbreaks in which Maine CDC is actively involved. Let's start with one outbreak that we just recently closed, and that was the outbreak at heart transportation. However, in recent days, we've also opened additional outbreak investigations. Recently, we opened an outbreak investigation into the BEK Incorporated facility in Brunswick after identifying four cases among staff members. We've also opened an epidemiological investigation into the Kids Count Child Care Center in Augusta after detecting four cases there. We've also, after detecting six cases, opened an investigation into the Lanza Group in Rockland, a biotech facility there. And finally, this morning, we opened, I'm sorry, yesterday evening, we open an outbreak investigation associated with the property management division of Maine's Department of Administrative and Financial Services. 
after finding a total of five cases of COVID-19. Just to provide a bit more detail about this investigation and this facility, the first thing I'd like to note is that this is not a facility that provides direct customer service to the people of Maine. In addition, Maine CDC is working very closely with the leadership of the Department of Administrative and Financial Services to conduct this outbreak investigation. DAFs, as that department is known, has already notified the close contacts of every other employee who may have been potentially exposed in the outbreak setting. Now, as we've talked about repeatedly with respect to outbreak, I'm sorry, workplace-based outbreak settings, the central question in a workplace outbreak is whether the COVID-19 transmission that we have detected occurred at the workplace or rather it wasn't just detected at the workplace and actually occurred somewhere else. That's really the fundamental question at play in virtually every workplace outbreak. As we've seen over and over in Maine, as we've opened and conducted these investigations, folks who work together often congregate with one another outside of the workplace. So one of our investigation's central goals is to better understand where the transmission occurred and whether it was at the workplace or whether it was outside of the workplace. To help speed that along, again, we are working very closely with our colleagues at DAFs to make sure that we've got all the best information. As we learn more about this investigation, we'll make sure we report back to everybody. Finally, some updates on some other outbreaks. At the Community Regional Charter School in Cornville, we have now detected a total of 13 total cases of COVID-19, four of which are among students and nine of which are among staff members. At the Woodland Pulp Facility in Baileyville, we've now identified a total of 19 cases. They had two additional positive results from their last round of testing among employees. Finally, at the ND Paper Facility in Rumford, there are a total of 24 cases that have cumulatively been associated with that facility. There is, a, there is yet another round of universal testing at that facility that is occurring today and tomorrow, after which time we'll have a better sense of whether there is ongoing transmission of COVID-19 associated with that facility. And finally, at the Pinnacle Healthcare Facility, we have identified a total of 22 cases of COVID-19, 15 of which are among residents, seven of which are among staff members. I'd like to next turn to a significant and important announcement regarding potential exposures of, to individuals of COVID-19 that recently occurred during some hockey games. Maine CDC has recently pieced together a series, a series of potential exposures related to an individual hockey referee. This is an individual who was on the ice as a referee for a total of eight games over a two day period. I'd like to read out the exact locations and times of those games, and then I'll talk about what to do. The eight games are, first at the Biddeford Ice Arena in Biddeford. On October 3rd, for the 8.35 a.m. game and the 10.05 a.m. games. This individual referee was on the ice. Similarly, at the Biddeford Ice Arena on October 4th, there were four games, 7.40 a.m., 9.20 a.m., 11 a.m., and 1 p.m. Next, at the North Yarmouth Academy, for one game on October 4th. This individual was on the ice from 6.30 a.m. until 10.15 a.m. And finally, at the Merrill Fay Arena in Laconia in New Hampshire, this individual was on the ice on October 3rd for the 5.45 p.m. game. Again, this is an individual hockey referee who was on the ice for these eight games over this two-day period, 
this individual has now tested positive for COVID-19. Maine CDC recommends that if you or a family member was on the ice for one of these games, you should consider yourself a close contact of someone who has COVID-19 and you should quarantine yourself for 14 days since your exposure on the ice. You should also consider getting tested. One of the easiest ways to do that is to go to a state of Maine sponsored swab and send site. There are a lot of ways to find out how to access those sites. You can go to the Get COVID-19 Tested website, or alternatively, simply go to a search engine and type in how to get tested for COVID-19 in Maine. That will take you to Governor Mills's Keep Maine Healthy website, in which there is a section on how and where to get tested for COVID-19 in Maine. If you are on the ice for one of these games, again, you are considered a close contact. The state of Maine and the Maine CDC have issued a standing order that allows you to be tested and you can visit a swab and send site and be tested for COVID-19 free of charge, especially if you were on the ice during one of these periods. In addition, if you develop symptoms consistent with COVID-19, such as a cough, a fever, or shortness of breath, please call your healthcare provider and notify them immediately of your exposure to a known individual with COVID-19. And please make that phone call before you arrive at any healthcare provider, whether it's your primary care physician, a nurse practitioner, an urgent care setting, or an emergency room. Please notify them first. Next, I'd like to turn to provide some numbers and updates on our testing. Right now in Maine, the seven-day positivity rate for PCR samples is 0.54%. To put that number in a national context, the US-wide rate for positivity right now is 5%, and the rate in Maine right now is 0.54%. The one day positivity rate in Maine was 0.45% based on 6,862 results that were reported to Maine CDC. Finally, in the testing volume in Maine right now is 427 PCR tests that are being conducted for every 100,000 people in Maine. Next, I'd like to provide an update on testing among out-of-state individuals. Cumulatively, there have been 11,180 PCR tests that have been run on individuals who have identified themselves as an out-of-state resident. Of those 11,180 results, there have been a total of 286 positives, the remainder, 10,894, have been negative. And finally, before I turn things over to Secretary Dunlap, I'd like to talk to everyone about a very significant milestone. The Maine CDC's Health and Environmental Testing Laboratory, at some time yesterday, processed its 100,000th sample for COVID-19. 100,000 samples just over the past seven months, the main CDC laboratory has tested. Now, I want to put that number in a little bit of context. In a typical year, the main CDC laboratory processes approximately 40,000 samples for all of its microbiology section. We've done two and a half times that just for COVID 19 just in seven months. We've done 100,000 in seven months, whereas in a typical year, we would do about 40,000 over a 12-month period. But by the way, even though COVID-19 rates have risen, the rates of other infectious diseases haven't magically gone away or dwindled. So even though the main CDC laboratory 
has clocked 100,000 samples, we're still doing testing for rabies because rabies hasn't gone away. And by the way, even though COVID is front and center right now, threats from our environment, especially threats to children from things like lead poisoning, haven't gone away. Maine CDC's laboratory continues to do that testing as well. In addition, the need to make sure that our lakes and rivers are clean hasn't gone away. Maine CDC's laboratory is continuing with that testing. In addition, it's still the second wave of tick season. Maine CDC's laboratory continues to do testing there. I wanna take a second, not just to congratulate, but to honor every single employee of Maine CDC's laboratory for the countless hours that they've put in over the past seven months. It has not been easy. They've kept every single one of the plates spinning while simultaneously bringing on a brand new test for COVID-19 and not just bringing it on, but doing 100,000 tests and processing those results to people across Maine who were eagerly awaiting for them over the past seven months. So again, I'd like to take a second, not just to thank them, not just to congratulate them, but to honor them for the hours and service that they have put in for the people of Maine. If you happen to know someone who works at the Maine CDC laboratory, please give them a high five from six feet away and thank them for all the work that they've done. They are part of the reason that we are where we are right now with respect to COVID-19 as a state. So I really do thank them, congratulate them and honor them. With that, Mr. Secretary, I'd like to turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. We've had a lot of questions about the conduct of the election given the state of the global pandemic, something that we've been working on quite closely with your office uh, since the governor declared the state of civil emergency back in the middle of March. So a couple of things that people should be aware of as we get closer to the election. We will have in-person voting at all polling places on election day, which is Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020. All those polling places will be open for in-person voting. Voters should allow for some additional time to complete the voting process as wait times are expected to be longer than usual due to the capacity limits, social distancing and sanitation measures in place at your polling site. You may have to wait outside due to, the, due to these restrictions, so be prepared for the weather and dress accordingly. We are providing personal protective equipment for election workers and requiring the use of masks and, and uh, tabletop barriers, which have been donated generously by L.L. Bean and Flowfold uh, for this election. We purchased that equipment for the July primary. Voting booths will be sanitized according to CDC guidelines and pens will be single use. We're getting about a quarter million pens so that voters get their ballot, they mark their ballot, and then they can either drop the pen in a box or take it with them for later use for other writing uh, situations that they may come across in the course of their daily lives. Um, voters are strongly encouraged to wear a face covering, but they won't be turned away from voting for not wearing one. Uh, candidates and petitioners will be allowed to set up outside and will be required to wear a face cloth covering and maintain six feet social distancing from voters. Uh, a great way to get around all this is to vote by absentee. And again, since I'm with Dr. Shaw, you deserve a few numbers, which in 2016 in the, pre in the presidential cycle, using the absentee ballot request service, we issued something like 42,000 ballots. Uh, 140 requests were processed the first day it was open. This year, we so far upped around 270,000 absentee ballot requests. Um, we did 20,000 the first day, 2,000 the first hour. So voters are keenly engaged in utilizing this great method of voting safely. Now, already we have both in-person absentee voting uh, during your town hall's office hours before election day. And also you can use uh, the mail service or use a Dropbox if your town has acquired one. Be aware that if you're using a Dropbox, you should only drop your ballot in your town's Dropbox and it still needs to be put into the envelope and you need to sign the back flap. If you're using a Dropbox, you don't need to utilize postage, but you will be expected to use postage if you're sending it through the mail. Um, if, you are, if you're gonna vote by absentee, make sure you ask for it as soon as possible and return it to your, cl your clerk as soon as you can to allow them to take advantage of early processing times pursuant to the governor's executive order and give them time to connect with voters to cure any defects that may emerge, such as forgetting to sign the envelope is a, is a frequent reason that ballots are rejected. We also have the absentee ballot tracking service so that you can check online 
to make sure that your ballot has been received by your clerk and has been accepted. If there's any issue with it, they are encouraged to call you in the first 24 hours so you can fix any defects before it is, is logged in as accepted. And every absentee ballot is counted in the state of Maine. So if people have questions, they should contact our office at 626-8400 or use the, our email address at sos.office at maine.gov. One of the things that I wanna emphasize in this process is that we worked for three months before the primary with Dr. Shaw and his team to make sure that we could conduct an election on a statewide basis in a safe way. In our examination of the numbers posted by CDC in the weeks that followed the primary, we saw no elevation in the number of infections, which tells us that if you follow the guidelines and use things like our face masks, um, then we have a very strong chance at defeating the spread of the coronavirus and that people can vote, participate in our democracy and do so without fear. And we wanna thank Dr. Shaw and his team for helping us with this. Thank you, Secretary Dunlap, and we likewise thank you for, for leading the way on this, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure to partner with you to keep voting safe this year. Uh, with that, we're going to turn to our colleagues in the media today, uh, and the first question for today goes to Ashley Blackford from WAGM. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Um, right now, the website is showing seven active cases in Aroostook County, and we're hearing there may be a few more. Now that's the most active cases we've had at one time in this area, I believe. Are you able to speak about those or tell us if they're related at all? Um, so first of all, Ashley, what we've seen, not just in Aroostook County, but a number of other counties across the state is that there has been increased spread of COVID-19 and increased numbers of cases of COVID-19. As we talked about, I think about a week ago, some of that, some is related to the expansion of testing, but not all. We're simultaneously seeing evidence of more transmission as well. Um, we haven't opened any recent outbreaks in Aroostook County, so I can't speak to any of those situations. But what I can say is that across the state, we're seeing dispersion of COVID-19 to counties where the rates were previously low. We're now seeing upticks all across the state, particularly in areas, again, where rates were previously low, but specifically, in situations that are not necessarily connected to outbreaks. That is, in a sense, evidence of greater community transmission. It's something that's of a concern to us. Um, as it relates to the county in particular, we're keeping our eyes open for any other modes of transmission that might be out there. I'm gonna turn now to Amy Brown. And again, Secretary Dunlap and I are happy to take questions on anything COVID or voting related. Great, thank you. Uh, Secretary Dunlap, starting with you, what are you doing to plan for any possible disruption from people claiming to be election observers? We've been issuing guidance to town election officials along this line and working with the Attorney General's office and the Governor's office to get this information out. The, lo the election, although we uh, supervise the, the printing of the ballots and we do the tabulation and certification of the vote, the actual election is run at the town level. And so the individual polling place warden is the official that has the exclusive authority to regulate activity, not only in the polling place, but within 250 feet of the entrance of the polling place. So we've been making sure that wardens have that information, that if someone tries to intimidate voters or get in the way of people participating in the process, they have the legal authority to ask them to leave. And if they refuse, they can have law enforcement remove them uh, for the duration of the election if they do not comply with the warden's directives. Great, thank you. And just to follow up on that, is there a hotline with your uh, at your office or somewhere else that people who feel like they're uh, being intimidated at the voting place can contact someone yes. and uh, report that? Yes, we have our uh, election division by the phones uh, all day on election day, and they work directly with local election officials to not only answer questions like this, but any other troubleshooting questions that come up throughout the course of, of the day. Usually we have folks on the phones beginning at 7 a.m. and they will be there till about 11 o'clock at night on election day. At that number you gave earlier? That's actually our number, our direct line. Uh, the number for the elections division is 624-7736. Uh, um, Thank you. And uh, Dr. Shah, I have a question for you as well, if you don't mind. Sure, Amy. Uh, how does flu transmission differ from COVID transmission? And can you report on any flu activity in the state so far? Sure, sure. So our flu, our, our flu reports 
come out, they can be found on our website. We're at the very, very beginning of the flu season. So flu transmission activity is what we would expect for this time of the year. But we fully simultaneously expect it to increase as it has in every other year as we get deeper and deeper into flu season. The flu is transmitted in similar fashion to COVID-19. That is to say, primarily by respiratory droplets, but also a smaller fraction by longer distance airborne transmission. What differentiates the flu from COVID-19 from a transmission perspective is that COVID-19 can be transmitted from person to person more easily than the flu. That's one reason COVID-19 has exploded around the globe in the fashion that it has. So even though our concern level for flu remains really high, we're simultaneously concerned about COVID-19 because the symptoms are very similar and the same systems, the same conditions environmentally that can generate high levels of COVID-19 transmission being in close proximity for long periods of time, that is to say duration and density. Those same conditions can lead to transmission of both COVID and flu because of this respiratory mode of transmission that is the predominant way that flu is transmitted. Is there any difference in the rate of transmission by contact, like touch surfaces? Uh, contact or, or so-called fomite-based transmission appears to be low for both COVID-19 and the flu. It's not ever been ruled out, it can happen, but it seems to not contribute to the generation or development of outbreaks. But this is one reason why hand washing is so critical. Hand washing has, I think, been something we've talked about now going back to the very first press briefing. The reason why hand washing is so critical is that to the extent that there are concerns around surface-based transmission of either the flu or COVID-19, vigorous washing of hands or the use of hand sanitizer can significantly reduce that, that likelihood. That is probably one reason we haven't seen outbreaks, for example, associated with high touch surfaces. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn next to Rebecca Stefanski at News Center. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions that I had in mind, but just to touch on the flu question, are you hearing any reports about a lack of availability of vaccines that people are listening to your advice to go get it and are unable uh, to get the vaccines because they're not unavailable? Um, there are from time to time, almost for every year it seems, there are periodic, sporadic, limited stockouts of some of the vaccines, uh, particularly the higher dose vaccine. But we are not aware, nor have, or we have not been made aware by either the US CDC or vaccine manufacturers of any systematic shortages in vaccine levels uh, of availability. So there might be from time to time stockouts. What I would recommend folks to do is to call your physician's office, your healthcare provider's office, or your pharmacist before you go to show up for your flu shot, just to make sure that they've got in stock the right one for you. Again, there might be occasional stockouts, but there are not, so far as we are aware right now, not systematic disruptions in the supply lines that would account for large scale shortages. Okay, great. And if I may carry on with the, the couple of questions I had prepared. Um, it's not election day just quite yet. Uh, side note, make a plan to vote, everybody, per uh, Secretary Dunlap's advice. Um, but people are making holiday plans already. Do you have any specific advice for people who might have family or friends coming to visit, um, even if it's small, but um, their family? Any advice there? You know, even if it's small, unfortunately, there's a risk of COVID-19. And so what we would recommend is for folks who have family members who are coming in from one of the states that are not among those where the test or quarantine requirements has been lifted from states that still have higher degrees of COVID-19 transmission, that those family members get tested before they come. That's really the safest way to start enjoying the holidays. Even if family members are coming from states like New York or Connecticut or New Jersey or Massachusetts, even though it's not required, we still recommend they get tested before they come. Once they arrive, there is still a potential for COVID-19 transmission. Not too long ago, about a week ago, the US CDC 
published a report of a significant number of cases that were all linked to some family or a couple of families getting together in a house during a, during a vacation period. So even small numbers of people, if they're together in close proximity for a long period of time, can result in COVID-19 transmission. So the other thing that can be done is even though it's awkward, even though it's tough to do, even within the household, trying to maintain distance and wearing a face covering, particularly if folks are coming to visit from higher transmission areas, or if the folks that they're coming to visit in Maine are particularly vulnerable or have medical conditions that would make COVID-19 a significant threat. Okay, and then my last question that I have, um, in light of President Trump's positive COVID test and his activities since leaving Walter Reed, can you clarify what the CD guidelines are for someone to be considered no longer infectious? When is it safe to interact with other people and you're not, quote, shedding the virus? It, does the time frame differ for different kinds of patients? And what do you make of the, re the push for Regeneron for fast track uh, emergency use authorization? Sure. So the main CDC follows the U.S. CDC's guidelines with respect to determining when somebody can be put into that recovered category. By putting somebody into the recovered box, what we're really saying is that they can resume social activity, economic activity, workplace activity without a risk of transmitting COVID to anybody based on all the science we know. And the algorithm that we follow has a number of twists and turns in it. But in general, it requires individuals to go a certain number of days after their diagnosis or their original onset of symptoms. And those days have to be days in which they had zero symptoms of COVID whatsoever and were not taking any medications that might have masked those symptoms like Tylenol. So in short, it requires folks to be symptom free for a period of days. Now there are different, again, twists and turns and pathways that depend on when you may have been tested, what your symptom onset was. So I won't go through all of those here. They are, however, on the US CDC website and we follow those to a T when it comes time to determining when somebody is at no at low risk for transmitting COVID-19. Uh, and, and that's what's called the symptom pathway. Now, you, you raised questions about the Regeneron and the potential for an EUA. Uh, you know, really, in that situation, it does depend on the data. And all the data are not yet in. But in the time of a pandemic, sometimes adjustments are made. Based on the early data that we do have, that's really a better call for the FDA. We at the state level don't have access to those data in terms of what the latest clinical trials on the Regeneron product shows. FDA scientists are the ones who review those data and make the determination of whether in the midst of a pandemic, the benefits of approving the drug provisionally outweigh the risks. Okay, thank you, Dr. Shaw. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn now to Evan at the main beacon. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Uh, I have two questions for Secretary Dunlap. Um, just following up on the, the question asked before about voter intimidation, um, are you concerned that this activity might occur in Maine um, or is your office aware of any groups um, planning that type of disruption? We're not aware of anybody planning it. And typically what happens is we have to be prepared to field questions as they emerge. I've oftentimes likened it to being a shortstop in a batting cage. You know, you, do, you don't really know which direction things are gonna come at you from, but you just have to be prepared to field them when they do. So, you know, the, the issues that we might deal with could range anywhere from confusion about what people can do, where they can be, um, you know, what kind of activities they can engage in. And sometimes people can be quite assertive about what they perceive their rights to be. And our job at that juncture is to, is to answer the questions of the local clerks and the election wardens to make sure they are, uh, they are administering the law correctly. Uh, but we don't know of any plans to openly disrupt polling stations or in-person voting. Um, we almost never do. If something like that happens, uh, if, if someone does try to, to interfere with the ability to, of people to participate in the democratic process, uh, we generally try to respond quite quickly so that voters are not given bad information that they then subsequently act on. So we don't know of anything organized happening or even anything that's not organized. We just try to prepare for a, for a smooth election and make sure that everybody has the opportunity to vote. 
Thank you. Um, and so my second question is, um, I understand that most states now have online voter registration systems, but um, that there wasn't quite enough time to implement it um, for this election here in Maine. Is that something that you'll be working to put in place for future elections? Uh, we think we'll probably see proposals for that in the upcoming legislative session. We know as we got into this, uh, this was something that a lot of people were talking about that we should try to implement. But the thing that we were lacking really was not only the time and the resources, but we also don't have a legal mandate to do it. And while the governor has expansive powers under the emergency authority granted her, uh, we know that she cannot create law. So um, that was something that's gonna have to wait for the next legislative session. It would have been incredibly useful to have, um, you know, the process that we have currently for voter registration is in fact a paper-based uh, processed and you know the governor has adjusted the deadlines for people to mail in um, their voter registration materials out to, to 15 days before the election. Again we are strongly urging people to take care of these things well in advance uh, although we know that people will be prepared the local election officials will be prepared to process updates to registrations and new registrations up to and including election day under Maine's election day registration law. So we'll be ready in any case for whatever comes. Um, and so, so just to be clear there, you're saying that, that your office and the governor's office can't do that unilaterally. It has to be a legislative um, law that's passed before that, that can happen. That's correct. Thank you. I'm gonna turn next to Patty White at Maine Public. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. I've got a question about the outbreak at the Community Regional Charter School. My understanding is that the cases are mostly among the administrative staff. What can you tell us about how the cases were transmitted? Um, well, that's, that's one of the key focuses of our investigation right now, Patty. Uh, you are right, based on the 13 cases that we are aware of, uh, nine, of uh, nine of them are among staff. We are, of course, asking and investigating to what extent protective gear like face coverings were used, uh, were used in use in the school. Uh, so that's certainly one of the first questions our team asked uh, as the investigation kicked off early this morning. We've also seen in other outbreak settings of this nature, a phenomenon where face coverings are in use when, for example, when individuals are around others. So in this setting, when teachers may be around students or when healthcare workers are around patients, but when the employees are congregating with one another in a break room or in a cafeteria, face covering usage might fall off. We saw that at an outbreak at a hospital earlier in the summer. So that's another hypothesis that we're asking about and gathering facts and data about. At this time, Patty, we haven't arrived at a precise mode of transmission, either among staff or from, or alternatively, whether there was transmission from staff to students, but those are the key questions we're investigating right now. And so to, to be sure, we, we just opened the, and we just kicked off the investigation now about six hours and 36 minutes ago. So we're still in the very early stages. Got it. So I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer my next question, but someone I spoke to um, from the school said that staff did follow safety protocols, but, you know, most of the time, but, you know, in meetings, maybe it was hard to maintain a six foot distance all the time. And they took off masks to answer phones. Um, it just made me wonder, I mean, I think we typically associate outbreaks with sort of major lapses in safety protocols, but um, is it possible you can, you know, be wearing masks and be three feet apart? And is this maybe, does this demonstrate that there can be sort of smaller lapses that lead to? If, if true, Patty, and I'm, I'm I, I, so I'm answering something, uh, I don't want to go too far into speculation, uh, but if true, and let, let me phrase it differently. There are documented outbreaks that have been noted in the literature where even the small lapses, as you framed it, have generated transmission as well as outbreak settings. Uh, what we've seen in situations like workplaces is that individuals are there every day. So one person can transmit it to another, and then you've got two cases. A couple of days later, two cases can transmit it to two more people. And pretty soon outbreak settings can occur in workplaces because of the the fact that it's the same group of people who are interacting day in and day out. We do not at this time know whether that is the pattern that unfolded at this particular school, this particular workplace, but there are cases in the literature where, as you said, even those small uh, lapses, uh, momentary times when face covering use was not as fastidious as it perhaps should have been, 
that can lead to transmission. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Emily Burnham from the Bangor Daily News. Thanks, Dr. Shah. I have two questions um, about Halloween. Um, one uh, very specific and one a lot more general. Um, the first one about uh, the very specifically is um, uh, when it comes to uh, trick or treating, um, who would be the, the person or people more at risk? Is it the trick or treaters who would be touching and eating the candy that came from a home where someone might be infected? Or is it the homeowners who have a passing interaction with dozens or perhaps possibly hundreds of trick-or-treaters, which is the individual or groups of people that would be more at risk? Uh, Emily, I'm, I'm going to answer your question, but not exactly in the frame in which you proposed it. It's, it's less about the role that someone has during Halloween and more about their overall risk level or their risk categorization going in. So in general, it's more about concern for adults as compared to children. And specifically within adults, more concern for those who have chronic illnesses or other healthcare conditions that put them at particularly high risk. The activities that we would undertake at a normal Halloween celebration, uh, whether you are the, the person whom, who is opening the door and dispensing of the treats, or whether you're the parent who's accompanying your kids door to door, both put you into contact with different people over the course of a night. And even though those interactions could be fleeting, uh, unlikely to be for 15 minutes, but perhaps, but what we are concerned about is the possibility that you might be in an area where there are already multiple individuals who have COVID-19. And so by going door to door, you could receive a cumulative dose of the virus that at the end of the night is sufficiently large to cause COVID-19. So it's equal in terms of risk for both the parents who are opening the doors, as well as the kid, the parents who are shepherding the kids along. But our concern is more for the older folks rather than the younger ones. We're concerned about younger kids as well, to be sure, but particularly so about older adults. Great. And then my sort of follow-up question for that is, is much more broad, which is um, if the numbers in Maine don't change much between now and October 31st, what would you say to parents that are, are trying to decide whether or not they want to try to trick or treat in some capacity or go to a trunk or treat with their kids in some capacity on Halloween? Mm -hmm. Well, Emily, as you sort of implied in the question, we, we've still got 23 days to go before uh, Halloween is upon us. And much can change in 23 days. We've seen that uh, on, on several occasions over the course of the past seven months. So it's right now too early to make any predictions or plans, firm plans, around what might be going on on October 31st. That said, as the date nears, and we have a better sense of what the background rates of COVID-19 are, the fundamental question that I think parents have to keep in mind is what is their risk as parents and what is the risk for their kids? For the parents as well as the kids, the best way to get particularized advice on the different types of Halloween activities is to check in with your healthcare provider. For your parents, it might be your family physician, for the kids, their pediatrician, or their family doctor. There's no blanket advice because every family is different. It's also important to note that every Halloween activity is different. There is no standard one-size-fits-all approach to celebrating Halloween. So as with so many things in the era of COVID, it's not so much a question of what to do, it's a question of how to do what it is you want to do in a manner that is safe. So I would urge parents to think about two things. The first, what's your own family's risk, parents and kids? And then second, what are the activities that you feel like you are really wanting to celebrate as part of your Halloween? And which of those are safer and which of those are riskier? When you index those two together, there's a bit of a sliding scale. But in the middle, somewhere, there is a way that Halloween can be celebrated for every family. It may look completely different than what other families are doing, let alone compared to what we've done in previous years. But there is a way for Halloween to go on. It will just be much different. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Going to go next to Joe Waller at the Press Herald. 
Um, yes, hi. Just uh, a quick clarification on the hockey referee before I get to the questions. Um, do, were these youth I hockey games? And, that, and also, do we have a bottom line number of how many people were potentially exposed? Um, so right now, Joe, uh, let me let me actually I, I'm glad you raised that because I, I want to issue a on the spot uh, clarification to something I read out uh, for the uh, for the instance at the North Yarmouth Academy. I read out the time of day incorrectly uh, to to what I said was that it was an a.m. a game. So I'm going to read the correct time frame now on October 4th at the North Yarmouth Academy from 6.30 p.m. to 10.15 p.m. I erroneously said a.m. I regret that error. It was 6.30 a.m. to 10.15 p.m. Uh, Joe, with respect to the, to the participants, we're still getting that information. We understand that it was a mixture, uh, but I don't want to speak before I've got all of that confirmed. Uh, I think we wanted to, we just got this information maybe about an hour and 20 minutes ago. And so we wanted to get it out there because of obviously the concern around potential exposures. So I do not at this time know the exact composition of every single of those games. I'm assuming that given that one was at the academy, at least one was youth. But if you were on the ice or one of your family members was at that time, that's the critical feature. And then, um, Joe, in terms of the estimated numbers of exposures, we don't have a firm estimate. The initial investigation that's occurred since late this morning or early this afternoon puts the number at potentially 400, but that is a very, very, very early estimate, Joe. It could change upwards or downwards. Uh, so I, I, I offer that because you asked, but it is a very, very early number. And again, it is very much subject to change as we learn more about exactly what the dynamics were. Okay, thanks. And as far as my um, actual questions, um, so it, it doesn't appear, uh, looking at the community sports guidelines, it doesn't appear that hockey game, indoor hockey games amongst different teams would, would follow the community sports guidelines. Um, are those just recommendations by the state, or is that would that be considered a, a, a violation of executive orders? And if they're violations, would there be any sanctions on the ice arena? Etc. And I do have a follow up after that. Thank you. Sure, Joe. At, at this time, you know, we, again, we've just been made aware of this information. I personally have only been made aware of it just in the last hour and change. So at this time, we haven't started that analysis of uh, whether it was in, whether it comported with the guidelines and then where we may go from there. So right now, as of this time, Joe, we're focused on getting the word out, making sure that folks who are potentially exposed have that information early so that they can take appropriate steps to make sure that they and their family members stay safe. We'll start thinking about the other questions you raised once we get our handle around making sure that the public has been notified of what's going on. I guess just more broadly, it is a, a violation of community sports guidelines, of vi regardless of the specifics of the situation, um, a violation of the executive orders. And then my, I wanna make sure I get my other question in. My other question is, uh, you know, on November 2nd, if I live in a county that's still yellow, I can walk into a bar where there's 99 other people, but uh, my the local high school cross country team is not allowed to practice. Um, is there any discussion about having counties that are deemed yellow where the repercussions for that would not only fall on schools, but on other societal activities? Thanks. The, the short answer there, Joe, is so... Uh, answer your question first about community sports. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, we're, we're again, we're still looking into what the dynamics are there. We'll get back to you as it relates to this particular hockey setup as well. Uh, as it relates to the concordance between um, reopening, particularly as we go into phase four and how we may ratchet up or ratchet down ideas. You know, I, I think Joe, ever since phase one, since we launched that or announced that back in I believe April, we've always taken the view that there may be regional approaches to how we move forward through the phases of reopening and that particular activities may be deemed to be too risky or could be allowed to move forward based on local transmission dynamics at the time. So that hasn't changed. 
Uh, November 2nd is the targeted date, but again, we're continuing to review the epidemiological data. So to the sort of to the disconnect that you noted, we are simultaneously thinking about ways to create greater harmony, but it's got to make we've got to make sure that we contemplate that the risk that we're trying to guard against does differ based on different populations. For kids, we want to make sure we're being especially solicitous and, and protective. In addition to that, activities that involve a lot of exhalation, like sports activities, can generate more transmission. So we are looking to make sure that we are having parity in how we think about different activities. But Joe, I think it's simultaneously important to remember that like has to be compared with like. So as, as we kind of continue to study the data, we might come to different conclusions based on how things are looking in different counties. Uh, that's one reason we wanted to stagger this so we could continue our eyes on that. Uh, I'm going to turn next to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thanks so much for taking my question. So one quick question for Secretary of State Matt Dunlap. So obviously a lot of people are voting absentee this year. Do we have any idea of the tentative number of ballots that have already been cast so far? Well, we know that it's probably, thanks for the question, by the way. Uh, we know that uh, in terms of the ballots that we've logged in and attract is somewhere in the, in, as of yesterday, I think it was somewhere in the order of over 35,000 absentee ballots had already been turned back in, bearing in mind that they were sent out um, near the end of the last week. They have to be the possession of people who've requested them by 30 days before the election, which would have been Sunday. So some of those ballots are still in transit as uh, towns were trying uh, to get all those ballots in the mail to those voters who requested them. Uh, and people have already begun, uh, submitted them back in at a pretty heavy pace. So um, in, just in terms of the, of the context of that, we're talking about something like 260,000 absentee ballot requests. So we expect to see very heavy traffic in the return of absentee ballots not only by mail, but also by utilizing the drop boxes, which you know, has been an innovation that's used by other states that we've embraced this year during the pandemic as in order to give people another vector to return their absentee ballots safely and with the confidence that it'll be returned uh, in time to be, to be accepted. Uh, a couple of things about that, uh, because this is relatively new um, and every state's in the same sort of bind that we're in and trying to obtain these materials. Uh, the governor's office has been instrumental in providing us with logistical support and getting a design for the manufacture of drop boxes through Southern Maine Community College and also utilizing the office of procurement to sort of serve as a clearinghouse for those towns who wish to get them. And we are covering 80% of the costs of those drop boxes uh, up to $1,500 in value utilizing the CARES Act money. So. Uh, it's a new innovation. I just want to stress on that because we've already heard a couple of reports, people asking questions, you know, where they can, where they can put a ballot. It should be in their town's drop box. You know, if you are, for instance, if you live in Westbrook and you happen to go by Portland City Hall and you see a drop box there, don't put your ballot there. Take it to Westbrook and use their drop box. And it also has to be put in the envelope, the return envelope, and the voter must sign the back of the envelope which links them to the ballot uh, that is made anonymous when the ballot is processed and opened and then uh, prior to counting. So but those are important elements that people should bear in mind. And uh, it's, it's something that uh, we are preparing for a very, very heavy turnout by absentee, probably up to as many as 500 or 600,000 absentee ballots this year. Great, and sorry, one more final question. Um, is there a reason that there is no requirement for voters to wear a mask on election day when they go cast their ballot? You have a constitutional right to vote. And we don't believe legally that we can turn a voter away from the voting process because they are not wearing a mask. Um, and we had that discussion for July. Now, if, conversely, if you're going to city hall to get an absentee ballot and vote it in person at city hall, the, the executive order guidelines is that people must wear masks and you can be told that you cannot come into city hall if you're not going to wear a mask, even though you're getting an absentee ballot because you have plenty of time. Uh, election day is something of a different story where you know someone has a right to vote, uh, they are a qualified voter, um, they walk in at five minutes of eight, they've forgotten a mask, we do not believe we can turn them away. So uh, people can come in and vote 
without a mask. Although, Secretary Dunlap, we strongly, strongly urge everyone to wear that mask. Absolutely. We are strongly encouraging people to wear the mask. We just can't believe, we just don't believe that we can turn them away. Mm -hmm. It's the right thing to do. If you're doing your civic obligation by voting, do your civic obligation and wear a mask too. Uh, and the final question of the afternoon goes to Emily Tadlock at WABI. Uh, thanks, Dr. Shaw. So more COVID cases are popping up in the Skowhegan area. Schools there are closing as precautionary measure. And, you know, two major employers in Skowhegan had outbreaks of their own at one point. Are you worried at all about the potential for a larger spread in the Skowhegan area? Um, Emily, I'm, I'm generally concerned about the potential for a larger spread across the state, not specific to Skowhegan. What we've seen with respect to the recent uptick that we grappled with in and around your county could easily happen in other parts of the state. What I think is happening is that, first of all, transmission is occurring elsewhere across the state of Maine. That in and of itself raises concerns because as we contemplate the arrival of cases of COVID-19 in rural areas, that brings its own set of risks. Healthcare access may not be what it is in urban areas. Individuals have tight-knit groups of friends and families. It's one of the aspects that makes rural life great. But it's also one of the things that can make COVID transmit extremely easily. So Emily, the answer is that we are concerned about the emergence and the uptick in COVID, not just in the Skowhegan area, but across the state, particularly in counties that until very recently had had very little COVID activity. Skowhegan is an example of that. It's a case study and a cautionary tale of what can happen very easily in other parts of the, of the state as well. That was the last question for the afternoon. Secretary Dunlap, you've already got your mask back on, but I'd like to give you the last chance to offer any closing comments this afternoon if you'd like. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I think I, I just wanna state what our shared goal is here for this election in this public health crisis. Our goal is to make sure that every citizen who wishes to participate in our electoral process can do so with the confidence that their ballot will be accurately counted and without fear of the coronavirus. And we are strongly partnering with the CDC and the governor's office and all the town clerks to make sure that that happens. And if we follow these guidelines that Dr. Shaw has outlined, we are completely confident that we can have an election that is fair, free, transparent, and disease-free. So thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for joining us, as well as for your partnership with us to make Election Day as safe as possible. With that, we thank everyone. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. There's a lot of activity going on, so we appreciate both everyone's time this afternoon, as well as all the questions from our colleagues in the media. As always, we wish everyone good health. Please be kind, take care of one another. We'll catch up again next week.